Okay, you guys will, um, thank you very much for um, wanting to spend some time with us today. Um, it's 3.30 around. I am the only thing, well, this panel, I should blame them, are the only thing between you and um, happy hour. <laughs> so it's their fault. Um, you know, we have a couple of just things I want to ask you. Um, first of all, happy birthday, Therese. She's um, <laughs> So just, just very quickly, I'm, um, I want to know who's here because Russ is here. Come on, give him a... Uh, who's here because Garz is here? Who's here because Chris has a new job? Okay, I, I'm going to make this very quick. Um, I'm going to introduce the state CIO. And that's all I'm going to do, because I've been friends with Carlos for a very long time. He's done a wonderful job in this state. He's done, and he, he's super fair, super great at what he does. Really hard act to follow. Um, but I'm going to introduce my good friend the state CIO, Carlos Ramos. So i got to correct the record. We were good friends until he decided to leave me. Now he's dead to me. <laughs> Dark chocolate helps. We still got a ways to go. Hey, speaking of chocolate, okay, so Paul said we are the only thing between you guys and happy hour, but we know that, you know, you might need a little bit of a boost here, so we have Miss Vanna Morales. Please stand up, Vanna. If you're getting like sugar, sugar tricks for anybody, if you need some chocolate, and they're good chocolates. They're not like the stale leftover, you know, candy at the end of the Halloween bag that nobody wants. These are good ones. So if you need some, you know, just raise your hand. She's got a mean fastball, so be ready to catch or duck, okay? Okay, so uh, you saw the panel members up here. Did you notice that all the people that know them realize how much troublemakers there are? They're all sitting way in the back row. Right? <laughs> So just be careful, especially you guys up here. All right, so how many of you have been to some of the other sessions where they're discussing things like, you know, using analytics or open data or even other sessions on big data? How many of you were at the sessions today? Quite a few of you. So in a lot of those, you've heard about, uh, you know, the techniques, the, the use of the technology and what's available out there. What this session is really meant to do is to say, okay, now, how do we take what's the potential out there and actually make it actual. What's possible? How do we take what's possible into what's actionable? So our panel here is going to be here to discuss that. Um, before I start uh, asking the panel to say a few words, uh, I do want to thank uh, the folks that made this session possible, right? Our sponsors and the folks that actually helped put, to, put this together and had the great idea of bringing uh, uh, chocolate into the, <laughs> into the session. So first of all, Sousa, stand up now, if you don't mind. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for bringing together such a great panel, including probably the, guy, the luckiest guy who's going to work in the best place in, in all of state government. <laughs> I was talking about Russ. I wasn't talking about Russ. Okay. So um, you know, you all know who these folks are, right? There. If you look at state government, they're the ones that are kind of on the leading edge of getting things done of being innovative and trying to think you know, beyond what's just there in front of them in the way of day-to-day -day operations. So we asked them to come over here and talk to us about big data. And so one of the first questions I have is, you know, when I think of big data, you know, I wonder what are we all talking about, right? I think folks have different ideas and interpretations of what big data is. On the one hand, I think big data a lot of times refers to the use of predictive analytics to get data, I mean, to get value out of data sets, right? So maybe a lot of people have that as their definition. Big data can also refer to the growth in the number and the size and the scale of data sets. A lot of that driven by all these connected devices that are out there that are constantly gathering data, you know, compiling it and putting it, you know, making it available out there. So big data could be, you know, the growth of data, especially fed by a by connected devices, or it could be the use of analytics. So my first question to the panelists is, how do you, when you think of big data, what does it mean to you? What's your definition? So I'm gonna turn that over to the panelists. And actually, before I do that, I'm gonna tell you guys up front, 
This is gonna be as valuable as you make it. The more interactive that you make it, the more you know you engage the panel, the better. Because I'm gonna ask them a couple questions and I'm gonna turn it to you, the audience, and say, what do you guys wanna know about? What do you wanna hear from these folks, okay? So be thinking about what questions you wanna ask. So who wants to start? That looks like Chris just said he wanted to start. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what that meant. Pull the mic nice and close. Together, governance structure around our agency, and one of the things that we've done at the Department of Healthcare Services is we've partnered with our Health and Human Services Agency and the 15 different system departments within our agency to come up with a big govern, big data governance framework and standard. Um, what we're hoping to do is leverage our data user agreements and leverage the standardization of data within our applications. Because one of the challenges that we have that's not unique to the rest of the states, we collect multiple data on the same people and multiple systems. And how do we roll that data into a, what we call a data mark? So what we've done at DACS is we have a data warehouse. It's called MISDSS, which is the Management Information System Decision Support System, and this is the largest data warehouse in the country. And what this does is gives us to a single source of truth. Where we're taking data sets from those multiple subsystems and rolling them into that particular warehouse. So we can hit that with analytics, and we can also share that data across our organizational entities. We found that this has been very successful in setting this up and moving forward. And that way we've rolled enterprise governance into that standard of who gets access to the data, how it's managed from a security and privacy perspective, and how we're taking that data and moving forward. So for us, big data is very important within our agency. And there's also zero tolerance in terms of security. Because all of our data is public health information or PII, PHI data, which means we have zero, zero tolerance for data breaches. So it's very important that we have identity access management and other necessary security provisions around our data. So we are moving forward as an agency and adopting that as our single source of truth, making those data sets available for people to do <coughs> common data analytics from. So as we move all of that data from both a state perspective into a, an agency perspective, we see this as a potential enterprise as a shared service um, throughout the entities and also with our county partners who we share data with. So we are making strides, but the biggest thing I would have to say is putting the governance framework in place and ensuring the necessary processes and standards in place to both derive and you know, discover and access data from those particular areas. That's been really important for us and um, we'll get uh, developing a more mature model every day. So those are some of the things I think that we could partner with with Tim Garza and Water Resources with Russ here and really the entire state on how do we standardize data, how do we get access to our data sets, and how do we publish this within an open data portal framework. So that's really our perspective at the, from the healthcare area on big data. Alright, so Russ, um, Chris kind of blended the two uh, definitions, right? Applying analytics, but also compiling and, and growing the data sets that are out there. Um, and he also mentioned something kind of interesting. He mentioned, you know, sensitive information, right? A lot of that data is really personally identifiable and very sensitive. So I want to know, you know, what from a Department of Corrections perspective, um, how do you, what's your definition? What do you think of when you think of big data? What does it mean to you? Uh, part of the problem with the term big data is uh, we, we're all hearing it one hundred percent, but we also have a different interpretation of what big data really is and, and how we use it. Uh, and I think that the bottom line is it really is a, a catalyst in our organization. So if you think about the Department of Corrections, uh, anybody that was in one of the presentations earlier today, we're a fairly big organization, 60,000 employees. We've got two big ERP systems an SAP system on the back office side that does all of our financials and budgeting and purchasing and everything else. And a vendor management system that captures all kinds of information around our guests, our vendors that, that are housed in the state. <laughs> guests. <laughs> uh, so big data for us, um, how do you start to bring that information together to very different purposes to figure out if we're actually providing the right services? So the Department of Corrections, our mission it is to operate these correctional institutions. But one of the things we have to remember is most of the people in a correctional setting are coming back to our neighborhoods. Our goal is, is really that rehabilitative act. How do we make sure that when they come out, they're making better decisions? They're not going back to prison, not repeating the same behaviors. Now, how do we take the information that we have about our employees, our staff, our Cosmo, what we do in an institution, and all of the offender information, to get to evidence-based 
analytics. It says, if somebody goes through adult basic education classes provided by this vendor and this many hours in the classroom, and it costs X, how do we say that's a better outcome, that leads to better outcomes, than something, some other pattern of education where we teach them underwater welding and basket weaving? You know, there's no continuity there. How do we use that data to make sure that we're providing the right services? And I'll take the model even a step farther. One of the things you've probably heard in the, in the news in the past few years is public safety realignment. Our business model changed. It's not just our prisons in the state. It's the correctional system in the state, which stands to all the counties. So when an offender goes to a county jail that committed some crime, they go to court. They could live in a county jail for two months, two years, depending on the court. Then they come to the state. While they're in the county, they go through a bunch of assessments. What do they need for education? They need substance abuse program, anger management. They need job skills. Then they come to the state, and guess what? We do exactly the same thing. What do they need? How do we span those data sets? The county has information we have. We have information they have, or what they have. But how do we bring that together to make sure we're not duplicating efforts, and really do some analytics to make sure that we're providing the right services at the right time? So it's maybe a twist on big data, but it's now amalgamating those data sets that frankly we don't own um, into making sure that we provide the right services to the All right. Um, you bring up a couple of points that I'm going to come back to. Um, you know, one of them being, you know, communication among different levels of government and maybe agencies or organizations outside of your own department. So I want to get back to that in a little while to talk about what are the barriers that keep those sorts of things from happening. In the meantime, though, Tim, uh, within your agency, you have a number of different departments, and you guys got some big, big issues to deal with, right? The drought, for one, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and so I guess my question to you is... Don't tell the section over here, we have this water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part, I, I won't tell them that. I might tell them you spill it. <laughs> but I won't tell them that, we, that you serve yourself again. <laughs> okay. You for it. Oh. That was very smart of you to do that, by the way. What does big data mean to you? What, how do you define it? So I think Russ hit on it. We don't really like the word big. We think that the whole idea around uh, data analytics and the concept of big data is the ability to take disparate data, no matter where it's captured or why it's captured, and to bring it into a common format to create business value around it. I mean, in IT, we collect a lot of data. We talk about databases to the business. We talk about normalization. That means nothing to the business. The business wants information that they can quickly make uh, real-time decisions on. Today, Carlos talked about the drought. So if you talk about the 33 agencies we have, they all have data, but they have data in a different format. And that format has nothing to do with the technology. It has to do why are they collecting the data. When you think about water, is water quality, there's water depth, there's water flows, and all this then, what, how does that affect the fish? How does that affect climate control? So you gotta look at data, and I really look at data as disparate pieces of information, and big data allows us to bring it together and to make intelligent business decisions. And that's really why we're doing this. You know, so I, I, you know, the bites and the bits, those are all a necessary evil. What we really need to do is create value information. We talk in terms of information that can quickly make our citizens make good decisions, constituents make good decisions, and us be good business and aimers to those uh, areas. All right, so you brought up a point that I had uh, on my list of things to ask you about. Um, so you said it's not really the technology, it's really about you know the classification or the formatting of the data, right? Um, so one of the questions I was going to ask each of you is, okay, you know, one of the goals it seems to be uh, is opening up decision-making across organizations, whether it's, you know, between the state and the locals or local public safety entities, whether it's within multiple agencies within, or multiple departments within Health and Human Services, or in your case, spanning a group of 33 different departments. Mm -hmm. um, so my question, fundamentally my question is, how do we open up decision-making among those sorts of disparate groups? Uh, some of you talked about governance. Uh, some of you talked about having uh, essentially the technical capability through warehouses uh, to do that. So my question is, what are the barriers to getting better value, cross-agency or cross-collaborative value out of the data that we have? Is it technology? Is it a mindset? Is it culture? Is it, you know, people saying, no, it's my data, you know, mm -hmm. I use it for my purposes, you don't need to see it. Mm -hmm. Or is it something else? Is it inertia? Is it, you know, there's just 
you know, it's hard work to get it done. What, what's your perspective on that? <laughs> so, so I can start and then all of the above. Right? Kick it down the line because I think we all kind of uh, think about this a lot. Um, I think it's all culture. It's all behavior. Um, this is my data, and I'm afraid to share it with others because I think, you know, if a one a department collects data, why don't they want to share it with another department? I mean, what, what is, what's the fear? Is the fear that it's going to be judged? Or the fear is that something's going to be, a decision's going to be made, and it's going to be the wrong decision? Why, why do these things happen in government? And more importantly, I think, in order to take data to information, there's a mentality we have to change, especially in state government. We have a reporting mentality, not an analytical mentality. And today, think about it. How many analysts do we hire? And we do what? What do you do? Take your data, put it in a, a spreadsheet, and then hand it to a bunch of analysts. And what do they do? They look for patterns, they look for anomalies, and then they give you some conclusion, right? That's the analytics. So we're, we're just using reports, and then we're manually creating analytics. And that's the mentality we have to change, I think. The other thing is, I think we have to have trust data. You know, the data is never perfect. You know, in the science of the world, they know that 80% of their data are, is going to be right, 20 cents are going to be wrong. So they're okay with that. I think sometimes in government, we think that the data has to be 100% accurate before we move. I just think those are some cultural changes we have to, uh, to focus on. Okay. Chris, yeah. what's the other thoughts? I think those are good points to attend, May. The other issue that I would caution that we've run up against in negotiating our data, data user agreements is legal. Getting the attorneys in the same room to decide on who shares what. And why that information is not they're not in the same room. There's only one. There's nobody here from Healthcare Services. This is my last seven days. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, moving back to <laughs> That's been a big issue, is, is trying to get everybody to agree 15 different times within our agency. And the agency government structure that I spoke to earlier on, that's a way of coming to the table and really taking those sandboxes and jumping into one sandbox and agreeing on standardization across data needs and data elements. So when there's a data release form, everybody can sign off on the same form. It becomes cookie cutter in terms of your approach. And I can honestly say over the last six months, we've taken, like attorneys have taken consideration to say, you know what, our data isn't that much more unique or special than your data. We all work for the same agency. Let's go ahead and make this work. And we're starting to get those user agreements in place now that we can share data across the enterprise, which will make us a more valuable organization. And to Tim's point, I think the big issue with data that we see in our department agency is reconciliation. Um, people pull data from multiple subsystems and can't agree on the answer, whether it's dollars or numbers to our reporting bodies and agencies. So again, by going to a single source of truth and managing that information in the data warehouse, hopefully we'll get the same picture, or same pattern, or same story told, no matter what the analytical tools that are utilized. And that's really what we're seeing some synergies right now in our organization and at the agency level. So I, I really do want to answer yes to all the questions that, that Carlos asked. Uh, there is a lot of inertia. In our organization, we have very disparate lines of business, and they've operated historically to a certain extent as silos. Uh, the, the business processes in parole are very different than in adult institutions, which is very different than board of parole hearings. They've all created their own automation to support them. And the reality is they overlap a lot. And they're, they're referring to the same information. They're calling it something different. We don't have that data governance in place. They're using it for different purposes. Or potentially even reusing the same name for something when it's actually different things. So part of it is breaking down that inertia in the organization of it is mine. I collect it. I manage it. Well, an offender has one name. And it really should only be created one time. How do we figure out how to connect the systems so when I collect it in my system, which is the system of record, I share it to somebody else. They don't have to recreate it through you know, things along those lines. So it's breaking down some of those cultural barriers. And I don't think it's malicious intent. It's just that's the way we've always done it. I had control of my stuff. And, and giving that up gives me a sense of loss of control. And, and so there's a lot of things in there. I would also agree on the legal format. And, and Carlos mentioned this earlier uh, uh, in one of your questions. That, that personal information or what has to be protected. Um, with healthcare organizations, we have healthcare in our organization, um, we've got data that has to be protected on that side. We've got something called CORI, which is offender information. It's protected a little bit differently. Who needs access to what, and how do you set up the governance and control on that to make sure what I'm sharing is okay? And again, it, it is a little bit of a headbutting exercise with legal. Um, in fact, when we work with uh, local government, 
and we want to share information around, use an example of gang activity. I want to know what an offender was doing in his local community. He was affiliated with Gang X, because we have prison gangs as well. They can't give us that information because of a legal issue. How do we raise those conversations, whether it's in statute, in the courts, wherever it is, so that we can play the same game? It doesn't do any good for me to build really fancy technology and buy really fancy tools if the business conversation hasn't been conducted to say, we need to be playing the same game and figuring out how we can service things. Um, we stumble over our own feet with those things a lot. And as technologists, we try to solve a problem that's too far down the life cycle. We need to be pushing it up at the secretary, undersecretary, local government level, and figuring out how we can have some of those conversations to be in the same way. Okay, um, so um, we've been talking a little bit about barriers. We talked about the opportunities. I'm going to ask you guys one more question on barriers, and then we're going to turn it into a positive conversation to talk about what you guys have actually already done in spite of those things. Now, but before I do that, I wanted to note something. That phone you were hearing is actually Andrea's. She pointed at me, but it's actually, I recognize uh, the little alarm chime. Uh, sorry, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Okay, um, show of hands, how many of you are in the public sector? Can I see? Okay, you guys don't listen to this part, this question, okay? You can listen to the question, but don't listen to the answer. Okay, so Tim, uh, you mentioned that we have a reporting mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Here's my question to you guys. Does the state have the capacity or the capability? Do we have people that have more of the analytical perspective? Can we do analysis on the data? So don't listen to this part, you stay tuned. <laughs> Go ahead, they won't say anything. I, 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 think that, I, I, I think that the skill set is there because they're doing it manually. What I'm talking about is, is the time it takes when you get a mandatory like requirement to look at your budget or do something. What's the workload that goes into that? You, you know, you start scrambling for all the way all the disparate data are a different system. You have to go to this other system. You put them in all these spreadsheets, and then you give them to these good analysts, and then they do all the correlations. But by the time they get that back, they work to midnight. If this was in an analytical system where they could basically say, this is what I'm looking for, then you can get that to your constituents or the agencies within a five, ten minutes. So I think the ability of people are there. I just think that we have to teach them a new way of thinking. So the concept of a data, a, a data scientist or a data uh, architect is really something that I think we are missing a core competency around. And maybe the tools. I think the tools are out there. I think that um, you start with the business architecting. In order to look at big data, you have to look at informational architecture first and not work, look at technology architecture. The tools are there. The industry's there. We're just not there. All right. Chris, Russ, any different perspectives on that? Maybe a little, a little bit. I, I think the tools are getting there. I, I think there are some that exist, but I think the reality is that, that the risk of offending our sponsors, um, that it's not the truth. And what I mean when I say that is the tool might be there, but frankly, the people's skills to operate the tool effectively, I don't think of that. We, we have the aptitude, I agree, we have the people that, that have been doing this type of stuff on paper for a long time. And we throw a fancy tool at them, doesn't matter what the vendor is, and expect them to make magic. There's a lot of skill in just figuring out how to operate the tool. We've struggled with it. I'd love to sit here and say that we've mastered it and we're doing a great job. We struggle with it. And one of my other frustrations is we bring in folks from the outside that, frankly, I expect to be ahead of us and leading us down the path and showing us how these tools work and make them sing. They're a page ahead of us in the book. So we've had a really hard time finding capable folks in the consulting companies <laughs> to come in and actually help us do this. There are a lot of folks that want to do, want to do it, and the passion is there. But I do think that in the industry, this is a fairly new um, uh, effort that we're undertaking. So it's going to get there, but it is not a silver bullet, and, and it doesn't matter how many people we throw at it with good intent, it's going to take some time to develop that success. Okay. Chris? Yeah, I would agree with what Dr. Russ and Tim on my thoughts. I mean, we use data analytics for progress and abuse, and we've shifted our transition from pay and chase, where we go out and actually arrest people and investigate to prevent the waste outcomes using data analytics. Um, the problem is we have talented people, we just don't have enough talented people to do predictive based analysis and try to analyze the field to do that. 
So that's where our gap is starting. So what we're doing is we're looking to the universities, um, UC Davis and other areas where there's a high research combination, bringing some of those folks in on contract to help us with predictive-based analytics, and then also provide cross-training to our existing staff that we have in the state area. The bottom line, it is a challenge to develop the right kinds of competencies in all the analytic areas. Um, but we're working towards attaining that. Okay, so it's a challenge, but the, the foundation for it is there. Right? Whether it's a tool set, whether it's a capacity or a mindset, you just gotta nurture it and grow it. Okay, so let's turn the discussion to, you know, we've talked about the barriers, uh, whether it's cultural, whether it's mindset, whether it's the way we've been trained, uh, whether it's inertia, or whether the tool sets are just not as intuitive as we would like them to be. But in spite of all those challenges, you guys have actually done stuff in your agencies and in your departments. Um, so now let's focus on what is actually possible, even with those limitations. Um, talk about, you know, how your department or your agency is using big data, how you're using data analytics or analysis to make better decisions or better strategies for your programmers. And then after that, then I'm going to turn to you guys to ask questions. So uh, be ready, because if you don't, then I'm going to ask you guys questions. And they're not going to be, you're going to be embarrassed. So, yeah, they'll be like, okay, so how many of those chocolates did you eat? <laughs> Five? Oh my god. <laughs> okay, anyway, guys, who wants to go first? Well, I'll go ahead and start. I guess going back to our data analytics tool and our fraud waste and abuse theory, we've made significant projects with fraud waste and abuse. Um, one of the tools that we brought in is, is a tool that helps really draw information together and functions really as, a, as an analytical business intelligence tool. And we take that data, as I mentioned, and extract that from our data warehouse. So it feeds in five different subsystems of healthcare data. And within that data, the uh, research scientists aggregate that in the analytical tool, and they provide a profile on folks that are potentially suspected of doing fraud, waste, and abuse in our uh, mental health and managed care areas and medical areas. And what we're finding is we're becoming very effective in seeing patterns of data. And we're using those patterns of data to suspend providers who are fraudulently, fraudulently billing the state. And it's been a very effective program that we continue to build out. Um, that being said, the thing that we're focusing on right now is the people side of this and developing the necessary skill sets of people that can go in and educate, intelligently use those tools to create more of a profile for these folks. We, we think that the fraud waste and analytica bill here in California is three to five billion dollars. So we're just on the cutting edge using these tools to make these informed decisions. And we're bringing in more partners like our agency sponsors and Department of Social Services and Department of Justice and U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI to work with us and partner around these common data sets. And I think it's very important that we're using that big data intelligently to make those types of decisions. And if we could do this statewide, I think we could make even a bigger focus on apprehending some of these folks and fraud in all aspects of the types of services that we're involved in. We use it, as you know, the resource agency really doesn't do a lot of citizen-based uh, transactions. So we use uh, big data a little bit different. We really use it to uh, enhance our engineering and our scientific predictabilities, modeling, and design. Uh, for instance, you know, we're in the middle of a drought, right? Everybody, right? So, 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 you're, you're only, so nobody took a shower this morning, right? <laughs> So, um, you know, we have to predict not that this drought's going to end tomorrow, but we're doing predictions of 10-year, 12-year droughts like they had in Australia. We have to do high-end modeling. So we, take, we need to take almost like 10 years worth of data, and we need to be able to put that in a 100-year pro projection. Before we went to these new uh, technologies, we would have to farm that out to like uh, laboratories and stuff, and it would take like three months to get the uh, results back. Now we can produce a hundred years worth of projections in a forty-hour time period, and that's what it's kind of done for us. So, so we can run more models. We can do more predictability. We also do this with our energy department. We also do this with fish and wildlife to look at the uh, impacts on the streams. We also do this in CAL FIRE as a first responder. Where can they, can they predict what would be the impact of fires during the drought? So we use it to really look at effect and also predictability, but also to prepare ourselves for what could happen. So these are the ways we use it. Right. So one of the first areas we've used it in, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, with 150,000 inmates in our system, uh, they're all going through some sort of training classes. There is a curriculum that an offender goes through. 
um, again, with the, the intent of giving them skills that they didn't have on the KMA system. But how do you measure those outcomes? So now we have systems behind them that create the attendance. You're registered for a class, but were you actually there? If you missed three days out of five because you had medical appointments or something along those lines, it's not fair to say the class didn't work. Your attendance in the class didn't work. We've never been able to look into it at that level across 35 institutions, 150,000 inmates, and all of the classes, every inmate in some sort of class, and a lot of them two or three at a time. We can now slice and dice that in minutes rather than pulling in a, a university group to take it off-site, work on it for six months, and come back to us. We can now slice that data and get a much better feel for what we need to adjust. It is it changing the times of day that we operate the classes. It might be as simple as that because that's when the clinicians are on site. That's when the dentists are here and half of the inmates are gone for dental services or things along those lines. So it, it's a much more uh, immediate reaction of being able to model or change the way our model works in the business environment based on the information we have at hand. Some of that could even be uh, related to things like the drought. You know, with, with less water use at the institutions, we're trying to get people outside earlier in the morning, uh, could be one of the things. So we have to change our schedule of events. If we're not looking at the data, then we don't know the impact of that and, and what it's actually doing. So the tools have actually been a great benefit to us in being able to look at that statewide, rather than having 35 institutions try to pump it out, which is really what was happening in the until recently. That's great. That's great. So, you know, in spite of the barriers, in spite of the challenges, and maybe the lack of capacity, um, in spite of the lawyers, where are our attorneys again? So, question, why do you guys hate data analytics? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't practice anymore. He's a recovery Yeah. So, these guys have actually managed to do something. So, for, again, public sector folks, you know, have, can you take something out of what they've done and say, hey, that could work in our organization? You know, take, can you take some ideas from here? So uh, let's turn it over to the audience to ask some questions. Who has a question after there? Can you say, uh, just say your name? I'm um, Kumar, Kumar so. um, There's big data. Some of that big data is open data. Others is it as a measure with health, with health and uh, uh, public safety type of stuff. With the data that is not necessarily open, are there efforts engaging universities and, and people who, who conduct studies and data and policy that would propose policies and legislation changes which will enable you to do very things like take away some of report, some of these uh, silos and barriers, and, and if I may, you have to enforce where there may be some reluctance to share data for that to happen. Are there efforts in the state that can be taken place to that end? So I'll get to them. We actually engage uh, UC Irvine um, in a number of areas. There's a lot of our data, which, which you're right, is not public information uh, that, that we have to, um, you know, it's a public safety issue, so we, we don't make that publicly available. But they'll come in and they'll look at our population and everything from fights or riots that we track. You know, where did they happen, when, who's on the yard, um, and propose legislation. And they'll come in and do, help us do population forecasts based on you know, Prop 47, whatever is coming up next year. If we make this type of change, will that impact our, our population? So absolutely, we pull in some, some experts to do a lot of those things. Because in a department the size of ours, our budget is dramatically impacted by population changes. And, and if we say our population is going up by 15,000 inmates, well, what does that mean? Does that mean a new prison? Yeah, the prison is it's hundreds of millions of dollars in capital expense. That's not the intent uh, you know, on where we want to be. So they, they try to be very accurate looking at that data. So even if it's not public information, we do try to pull in partners that help us slice things. And I'm Mark, we have a data research committee of healthcare services, and we evaluate requests that come in on a monthly basis and determine the security <coughs> for those requests, whether they're thesis or research papers, or people are looking at you know, healthcare related data. Uh, apps of some kind. So what we do is determine the need, determine the data request, determine the nature of the request, and really the scope and level of effort. And then that committee comprised of those research people go through and approve that type of information dissemination. 
and a lot of those folks, like independent healthcare committees, do a lot of trend analysis and predictive analysis. And once we're, they're done with those studies, they send that information back to the department to publish on their site or those third party healthcare sites. So there's a lot of collaboration that goes along at healthcare at the state level. Sort of kind of maybe just a quick follow-up. We also have a research organization that does a lot of that internally. One of the things that we use UC Irvine for um, is they'll take and extrapolate from the data into a data set that can be made public. So you know, they'll take out all the personal information, take out the specifics, and now say, in general, here are you know, population forecasts. And things like this. You asked a question about policy, so I'll, I'll address that one. I don't think policy is needed from that, that type of level, if you're thinking like from, you know, from, you know, government policy about, I think, about sharing, I think that can be done from within your agencies. I think your agency policy levels can talk about that. You know what's, you know what you can make accessible to the public, but what can you make accessible to each other so that you, because agencies are grouped in California because they're kind of in the same line of business, and that's why they're grouped that way. Yet within those agencies, those departments don't share data. That's not a that's not a, a, a policy for the horseshoe over at the capital. That's a policy for us who, who run those departments and, and to get together and say, look, we're in the same line of business. You need to court. So I think it's really a policy that can be driven at an agency level to force to you know encourage that sharing. You know something else you might be interested in. Uh, I think it was public health over over at uh, in Health and Human Services that actually established and developed a platform for open data. Uh, and you know they work within the agency, and particularly within all the different programs within public health, to try and, and post that public and open data. Uh, and I know that they've worked with researchers. Uh, other parts of the agency kind of jumped on board and said, "Hey, we should we should leverage this as much as we can." It also sparked some interest and in some thinking about, okay, how do we make this available across the whole government, uh, or at least at the state level. So now our own agency, the Government Operations Agency, is looking at how do we how do we actually do that? Either leverage that platform or establish a platform like that for the rest of government that with the specific purpose of open data and publicly available data and make that available not only to researchers but you know anybody who wants to make you know some sort of business out of it or, or anybody that can use it for good public policy. Um, so there, there's a level of interest and in fact even the legislature has looked at it because now there's there's at least one bill, maybe a couple of bills, working their way through the legislature on establishing an open data or a data chief or something like that, data director for for the state. So, so there's more and more interest in that in that area. If Chris is successful in identifying all those people that are taking the three or five billion dollars from us, it is going to impact you because they're going to be in jail. <laughs> yeah. So it does affect Absolutely. each other. Because I know when you had to empty out a lot of the prisons from overcrowding, I started hearing about it from the probation departments in all the counties. Absolutely. Oh, sure. They're killing us and they're hiring people like crazy, so there was an impact in that as well. So it does cross over a lot, even not just the departments, but you do affect each other as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to shower as much. <laughs> Did you have a question? So, there's a lot of data that we all use for these for the And even the with some of the impediments of a little bit of legal areas, there's a lot of shared data throughout the search actually. What you said about being people, a data scientist, a data that is nowhere. What I see throughout the state is more layers of management. Yeah, there's more than civil service and certification for management. But these pivotal roles that we need right now we need the needs of the state, we need the needs of these departments. Is that anywhere being pushed, discussed? I mean, this is really a civil service. Sure, it is. I'll tell you this. I know that there's an effort underway to remake our civil service system from top to bottom and to recognize, you know, the sorts of skill sets, if you will, that we need today. Whether or not they've zeroed in on data analytics or data analysts, I know business analysts is one of the ones that, that we in the IT community push a lot. I don't know whether they're doing that specifically as part of that effort, but I know individual agencies and departments, especially the ones that see the value in 
in having that ca that capability or trying to address it individually. But it, it's a good uh, it's a good suggestion and a good point. Uh, I know there's at least a couple of folks in here that are participating in that civil service reform effort. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's led through our agency, through the government operations agency. So we'll make sure that we uh, provide that feedback into them. Can I do a little follow-up? Sure. Yes, yes. I'm actually very different in the state, right? Um, is there any sense that you can do that? Different or better? Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Okay. Is there any sense that you can do that in the state of California? Because I know that the state of California has been very good about the state of California. I heard better. Just saying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, over your Can, can, can I address that? Because that, that's one of my pet peeves, Carlos, <laughs> is that the statement you made, and, and don't take offense to this, I think he, when, when IT has a victim mentality, then, they, then that's how the business views them. You want to be a partner, then you be a business enabler. You put yourself at the table. As far as the core competencies about data analysts, the data, those are titles. You can take any vacant position. You can take you can take an SSA position, you can take a uh, an ISA position, and you can recruit for those skill sets into existing. You can go out to the colleges again. So I think a lot of times we think that you know everything has to change for us to be successful. What has to change is us in IT government. We need a new style of IT, and IT you know is no different in IT in a private or public in my mind. You have one job, and that's to be a business enabler. And that's just a little pet peeve of mine. So that I think that we have to raise ourselves up, and then we have to make ourselves that way. So that's my philosophy. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Go ahead and finish your. Well, I actually agree with you. I mean, I was, was going to get this. And I think part of the problem. He just had a lot of candy. He just had a lot of candy. <laughs> 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 well, so I think part of the problem is that this. Of the way IT is seen in organizations by not understanding that, for instance, if you're going, right now you can't hire, for obviously. It's very, very hard to get a budget to hire people. You can in the business area because they bring in the dollars. They don't, but like, there's not this correlation and understanding of really all IT. It's trying to get the department to be a partner and, and to, to fulfill. You know, I, I would disagree with that. I think IT plays a role as a strategic partner. I know in our department, in our agency, we have a seat at the governance table with the director and the agency undersecretary to align IT with the needs of the business and talk about <coughs> business value. And your point, case in point about research people. I mean, we have a number of vacant positions in our department that we'll be directing to the scientist classification to address the changes we have and going from a stock shop to an analytics shop. Well, you know, here's my perspective on that. Those of us that are in IT, we can't wait for an invitation. You got to go out there and make it happen. Because if you wait for an invitation, you know, they have tons of things to worry about, whether you're a director or program at, you know, deputy or whatever. Uh, we kind of have to be proactive about that. Um, and if it's not happening in your agency, then make sure that either you drive that or get to your CIO, if you're not the department CIO, and say, hey, come on, we got to get in there. we got to be the ones to, to reach out and say, we can help. We understand what your business needs are, what your, what your issues and challenges are. We're here to help. Let us help. Give us a seat. Uh, you really do have to do that. And that, what I've seen is the most effective organizations are the ones where IT really does take that responsibility seriously and takes it on themselves to, to make it happen. I think one thing that kind of ties this together, our line of business is changing. You know, we talked about this, I mentioned it, it's kind of something that's growing up. It's a new technology, it's a new skill set. But one of the things we talk about is how we create our own capacity. So it is difficult to go hire people. We can't create new positions. I'm not sure the business can do it really a lot more flexibly than we can, but we should be able to create our own capacity to go do some of these things and change the jobs that we do. I don't need to do something because we've been doing it for 25 years. If I can commoditize that, put something in the cloud or offload something, take those positions and reclassify them, change them to what the job needs to be today. If I'm still making buggy whips, but buggies have been gone for 35 years, I'm in the wrong business. And that's why we exist, it is, is to make sure that we're driving the organization what it needs to be. Uh, the reality is sometimes it's like driving a tugboat, you can't turn on a dime, but that's why we're here, is to start to put that in motion to make sure we are aligning with the right services. 
And you know, part of it is data analytics, part of it is governance, part of it might be something that hasn't even come up yet. Uh, we're doing things in our department that frankly, two or three years ago, I would have said, that does not belong in the IT organization, and, and now we're doing it, because we are part of that executive team making the line of business work, not just the IT piece, but how are we solving the business problems. All right, so we got five minutes. Time for one more question. And uh, before we go to that question, I just want to say once again, uh, thank you to SUSE, thank you to Logic, and thank you to Oracle for helping to put this together. Okay, so we have, a, okay, we have three people wanting to ask questions. So you can ask, we'll go to all three of them, but you got to ask them quick and you guys got to answer them fast. Go, you're first. All right, uh, first, I just want to say one of you gets to answer that. I'll start by just saying this is upgrading for our agency governance structure and enterprise governance structure. We need an alignment of the lines of business. We we'll talk about how we want to align policies with big data. So we're building standardization across our systems to ensure that our own policies are very unrelated so we can access data from those particular things. And we're looking at single sign-on as well in terms of our user accessibility across the agency. So that's one way. All right, great. Our attorney coming back here. <laughs> and, and, and this is definitely not the, the, the attorney speaking here. Okay, we're talking big data. The biggest data out there is the community, the crowd, the, the exhaust data out there. What's the appetite for actually crowdsourcing, bringing in data that you guys actually can't control? Can't hold, you know, what's that? That's the biggest data of all. Yes, you're absolutely right. One of the things that in the in the water data, 90% of that data is with the locals. So we definitely need to be supporting that. Uh, in citizen data, I mean, that's what we need to be supporting. So we're, if you have ideas in that, anybody, those those are the things that I think all of us want to do. We're all a big backer of open government data. Okay, last question, make it a good one. Okay. And Russ, I guess you get to answer it. Uh, my name is Corey Phillips, and uh, I like to pin what Mr. Garza was saying about... Uh, who? <laughs> Mr. Who? <laughs> you talking about Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. You know, it is big data, but yet what we're trying to do is fascinating. Data decisions are made quickly, um, and then to address the skill set. I think that um, analytics, uh, one of the sessions that I attended today, I have to agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, just an analyst, an analyst today, may not do the right person from the job. And we need to start looking at hiring people who have passion for this, high those work, and not somebody who's looking for more pay. Um, that's a big difference when we start looking at uh, hiring people. And I think it goes along with uh, just like these, uh, what she was saying, is that we need to, uh, the skill sets need to be there, but there needs to be a passion for this. Sure. No, I don't disagree. Any, any comments? Plus? So one of the things, one of the aptitudes that I think leads to that is making sure when we look at candidates, uh, what's their motivation? Uh, you, you want somebody that's very inquisitive. You don't just need a statistician to look at the numbers and slice and dice them, but to ask the question, why are we looking at the data in the first place? To make sure we're answering the right question. A lot of times I think we answer the question we know we can answer, uh, rather than, than peeling that onion and figuring out what that should be. And you're right, that is a different aptitude. It's a different type of person. The IT person is, is maybe a little less engineer than we used to be, and, and more of a humanist, more of a, almost a social engineer to, to figure out what's going on with the issues. Good question. Way to end it. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, first start off by thanking Vanna Morales, our candy girl. <laughs> And because we have to, my former BFF, Paul Benedetto. <laughs> and how about one more round of applause for our, for our great panel. Thank you all, Paul, and enjoy a good happy hour. <laughs>